speaker is Michelle Lundy. Michelle Lundy hails from the island of Nassau, Bahamas. She relocated to Grand Bahama in 1985 and has lived on the island ever since. She holds a bachelor's of science degree in psychology from the University of Florida, Gainesville, and a master of science in abnormal and clinical psychology from Sa so Swansea University, Swansea, Wales, United Kingdom. She has been employed with the Public Hospital Authority at the Grand Bahama Health Services Rand Memorial Hospital as clinical psychologist for the last 20 years and is an integral part of the mental health team. She has responsibility for all psychological services at the hospital in Freeport and at the outline clinics in Sweetings Key, Grand Key, Eight Mile Rock, and West End. She also manages the employee assistance program at the hospital. Mrs. Lundy is one of 20 persons chosen by the American Embassy and the Bahamian government to train in the treatment of substance abuse and is now one of 20 internationally certified addiction professionals with the Colombo Plan Universal Treatment Curriculum in this region. As a result, her responsibilities now include training other professionals in the fight against drugs. And so far, she has conducted two formal trainings on Grand Bahama for psychologists, nurses, doctors, police officers, immigration officers, social workers, and other NGOs who come in contact with persons suffering from substance abuse. Ms. Lundy states that her satisfaction comes from helping others and knowing that her help has enabled them to cope more effectively with the challenges of life. She further states that there are three things in life she is passionate about, God, family, and career in that order. She is a devout Anglican and a member of the Church of Ascension. She has two adult children, Craig and Christina, and one grandson, Kai. She values her personal relationships and family fir and firmly believes that people who people you meet in your life's journey are there for a reason. They are not chance encounters and that when their purpose in your life has been fulfilled, their relationship ends. She believes that the lessons learned during these encounters help to develop and enhance your purpose and character. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our virtual hands together and let us welcome Michelle Lundy. Thank you so much, Mr. Clark. And thank you to everyone who's here. It's a pleasure being here. The um, parts of the the parts of the sessions that I caught yesterday, because I wasn't, unfortunately, wasn't able to stay to all, were excellent. Um, we, again, we had um, another mental health professional. And so I'm here to re-endorse everything that she said and to let you know that um, mental health has within its own set of healthcare workers, its own silos that we need to break. So let's begin our presentation and talk a little bit about mental health. First slide, please. So mental health, like any other long-term condition, is also complex and often linked with a range of other health, social, and physical challenges that must not be considered or treated in isolation. Working in silo is a problem mental health services have always faced and have always worked to address. And we have some advocacy days as a mental health forum that we have in October. In May, we also celebrate Mental Health Week. But to advocate for mental health is something that we have to do daily. Because as I think Dr. King said in her address, mental health is usually at the bottom of the totem pole when it comes to the healthcare system. 
And so this is a problem, like I said, that we have faced and worked with to address from time. From moving from the asylums of the past, because if you know way back in the day, anybody who was considered to have a mental illness, in fact, they called it um, a demonic illness back in the day, they were locked into asylums and just kept there. We moved from that into care in the community. And we now have a much more holistic and non-acute focus approach. And as we learn from and mirror how other health services have adapted, changed and modernized to the benefit of patients, clients and caregivers, we are now experiencing better service and outcomes but the collaboration must be there for it to happen. Now there's constant discussion about what's wrong with the mental health system, what theoretically can work and what we need to do or what we need to stop doing. And of course, this isn't a bad thing because we want the discussion, we want the talk because that is what is gonna keep our issues and our problems in the forefront. However, it appears that there continues to be a wide gap in much of these conversations because they have produced little in the way of concrete or practical changes in our mental health care system. What we are missing is putting together a constructive and a cohesive plan that puts into law concrete and evidence-based practices and programs. One major change, however, that must occur now is that we need to break down the silos where all of us in the mental health care system work and practice. Because within the mental health care system, like I said before, we have our fractions. The clinical professionals work in their area the case management and the related supportive services work in their area. Their residential treatment programs are in their corners and both the in and outpatient programs live and work in their own silos. So it is time to break down the walls and work collectively with one another. In mental health, we aim to work across all these areas, but I have to admit that sometimes we also work in a silo. We need to work more collaboratively with one another in evaluating and diagnosing individuals. We need to consult more with families, making them part of the team in any type of setting in order to ultimately help those and their loved ones suffering with a serious mental health issue. If mental health professionals from legal, clinical, case management, safety, and financial fields came together more frequently in a thoughtful and comprehensive system, we could develop a national wraparound system to respond to some of our mental health issues. Opening these channels of communication between and among the different mental health care areas would allow us to identify mental health concerns early on, be proactive and preventive, and to keep a person's on a professionally trained person's radar screen in a supportive manner. The ultimate goal of this is of course, better health outcomes for the patient, the family and the community. It's all intertwined and we need to bring them all together for the best possible outcome. So if we coordinate services and educate the public, we can turn around the stigma, the negativity, and the pervasive misinformation that's out there. People would be able to see mental illness as a lifelong issue that requires and deserves support, understanding and treatment. We need to work on the mindset. Look at how COVID-19, as well as other longstanding systemic challenges stand in the way of effectively treating mental illness in our country. Our patients, the mentally unwell, people who may need specialist attention because they are living with chronic and enduring conditions, such as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, have been hardest hit by the pandemic, as the move to online working has meant that community services and peer support groups have been less accessible to them. So they've really been left as a standalone. And in fact, in Grand Bahama, 
where we had challenges with our hospital because of Dorian, that has, it has been even more difficult for them. There has been much talk about reform and inclusion of mental health practices in the healthcare system, which alludes to the idea that mental health may be rising up from the bottom of the totem pole in healthcare. And these talks and suggestions again are very much welcome. However, it would be wrong to suggest that this is a game changing moment in how our country approaches mental health care. There are many more important issues that the government needs to prioritize if it's truly committed to improving things for patients with mental illness. These suggestions are gonna do little to change the experience of care in a consistently underfunded system. A system that for all the talk of parity of esteem between physical and mental health care still lacks the money, the workforce planning and training and the community resources to provide adequate support to mental health care. What can we do? What can be done? Improving mental health services is gonna require substantial investment and much collaboration. Inpatient wards need repair and they lack modern amenities. They are not the therapeutic environments that they need to be. After Dorian, as I stated before, the flooding of the hospital led to extensive repair and improvement, but almost all of this money will undoubtedly be spent on physical health care or the medical aspect of health care. New accident and emergency treatments, maternity, medical, and surgical wards, and COVID centers are wonderful, and they are needed. But if the government is serious about improving mental health care, then a good place to start would be with meaningful investment in new mental health wards fit for the 21st century. Some years ago, the World Health Organization recognized that mental, neurological, and substance use disorders are highly prevalent and burdensome globally. The gap between what is urgently needed and what is available to reduce the burden is still very wide. The MH Gap Initiative is the World Health Organization's action plan to scale up services for mental, neurological, and substance use disorders for countries, especially with low and lower middle incomes. And we appreciate the fact that it has been embraced by the healthcare service in the Bahamas. However, when we get into our individual hospitals, it has been sometimes difficult to get some of the staff that we need due to schedules, due to um, decrease in staff, due to so many other variables to participate in this training. Successful scaling up is the joint responsibility of governments, health professionals, civil society, communities and families with support from the international community. The essence of MHGAP is building partnerships for collective action. A commitment is needed from all partners to respond to this urgent public health need. And the time to act is now. Not everyone with a mental illness can live at home with family or even completely live independently. So an acute mental health ward is not always the right place for someone with a chronic mental illness learning disability or even autism. Far too often, these people become trapped in the mental health system and spend many months living as inpatients on acute wards. This needs to change. And the government with the assistance of the community and other NGOs must look at developing housing strategies to better support this group. We need to have halfway houses so that when a patient is released, they're able to live and move towards living independently or else we will continue with our revolving door type of care. We need to advocate as mental health professionals that more sheltered housing and other forms of supported living in the community are available for people with severe illness, learning disabilities and autism. 
Look at our addiction services, and Troy mentioned that as well. They should be entrusted to the healthcare system. At present, care for these patients are fragmented and patchy, and there is an unhelpful disconnect between mental health services and the treatment of addiction. And I say, and we, we know that addiction is a brain disease. It's a brain disease. And so it is an illness. It's a mental health illness. Finally, there needs to be proper integration of physical and mental health services. I can't stress that enough. Many patients with chronic and enduring mental illness also experience poor physical health and a reduced life expectancy. However, in general, physical and mental health services tend to work in silos and are rarely delivered in the same place, as well as adding to the stigma around mental illness, poor integration of physical and mental health care can result in delays to patients accessing the help that they need. And we see this very often because we live in a small, we live on a small island. Everybody knows uh, the population of um, the mentally ill persons that they may see outside the homeless ones. And so when these persons present themselves to our emergency room, maybe for a medical condition and not a mental health condition, they often have to wait or they're overlooked and they have to wait until a mental health profession has been contacted to come in and see them. And this is because the familiarity of that patient coming in. Um, sometimes the medical staff do not check to see if there is a medical reason that they're complaining about the pain and they just treat it, oh, that's a mental health patient. We're gonna call in mental health services to deal with that patient and everything will be all right. But it could very well be a medical issue and that could lead to a long-term problem for that patient. So this needs to change if we are to support people with long-term mental illness to live fuller and more healthy lives. Mental health services cover an incredibly wide spectrum of services patients and clients need. And so integrating mental health with other care settings through technology and information focused on the patient will support better prevention treatment and long-term patient outcomes delivered regardless of care setting or condition. Many mental health patients have highly complex physical and mental needs that demand those who treat them to have access to all the information needed to support their care. So a single integrated electronic health record for every mental patient that integrates with other care set settings could act as a catalyst needed to breach the traditional divide between mental health and other healthcare settings. Breaking down silos makes sense in the business world, the campus setting, the workplace, healthcare, and the community at large. Better communication in any setting means better outcome. Mental health is no exception. Let's take the next steps and work together to form a constructive a realistic and a real-time approach. We know the issues, the studies, the conversations, and the best practices. What are we waiting for? We need to just do this. It's a short presentation, but like I said, we have, we had prior to my presentation, we had Dr. Tracy King, who gave a very in-depth presentation on the silos in mental health. And I do believe we have a, another mental health professional coming up and we embrace all of this because as said, mental health is very often placed at the bottom of the totem pole. But when we look at it, we can function without good mental health. We cannot function with we can't do anything physically or help ourselves physically if we're not functioning at the top part of our mental health capacity. And so we need to put it where it belongs. We need to work together to bring mental health to the forefront. We need to work together to treat the whole person. And our mental health cannot be overlooked. And 
we need to collaborate. Thank you so much for listening. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Lundy. And now the floor is open for questions, discussion, because we are on time. We have 10, we have actually seven minutes, seven minutes for questions before we bring on our next speaker. So are there any questions, comments, concern as it relates to mental health and breaking out of silos? Um, you know, I would have asked this question yesterday, Ms. Lundy, and I know I had several discussions with you before, but I don't know if I asked you this question, but the question I asked, and I asked Dr. Tracy King this, uh, do you think it's, okay, there are two questions. The first one is that, uh, do you think the social ills or the criminal problems that we fa are facing in our country and throughout the Caribbean, should it be taken more primarily from a public health perspective and then secondary from a criminal justice perspective? How do you see it? I see Anne-Marie laughing. So Anne-Marie, you can chime in this after uh, Michelle uh, respond to me. I'm speaking on breaking silos, Mr. Clark. Yes. So the thing is, we want to collaborate both of those perspectives when we want to make the criminal society, the criminal person, the person who is serving, I want to be politically correct when I say this, Troy, so please help me. I don't want to say a criminal, okay? The, uh, you can say the offender. The offender. Yes. When we look at the offender, we want to be able to take both sides in collaboration to help that person. I don't think one is more. I think we need to work together. Okay. You are speaking on silos. Your okay. topic, you brought it up. Okay, good. Go ahead. Go ahead, Anne-Marie. The reason why I laugh is because you took the word out of my mouth. Um, I was thinking and I have been thinking for quite a long time mm -hmm. that until we begin to see public health as a significant part of offending mm -hmm. and put things in perspective where we have public health into that loop as a significant body. Right we not in the game, okay. we not in the game. We have public health as a separate part of the, of the health system. And that doesn't see itself as a significant part of the offending system. Let's just take a little part of it, for example, let's look at um, domestic violence, just as an issue. Right. Where, where a victim normally go as a first line of intervention? When a victim would not even speak. If you have offending, a lot of times offending begin from very young. Where do we start? Mm -hmm. You have mental health issues incrementally taking shape a lot of times within the home. We look for help and in our own culture, we go all about to look for help, including the little bush bath and all sorts of things until we reach, we somehow reach the criminal justice system in to have somebody intervene and the court in its wisdom will make a referral to maybe probation, all the different entities that we have trying to avoid incarcerating in particularly a, a young person. But before that ever happens, you have a health center. When you look at the history, when you do the risk assessment, 
you see a lot of things that tells you that public health was involved almost at the very beginning. Right. People tell you, parents tell you, significant others will tell you, I tried. You have nurses, community nurses, going to people's homes. As I do have a sister working in community nursing and will tell me, you know, I'm seeing this and I'm seeing the other and I'm seeing that happening in this home, but they, they are not connected to any entity to make a proper referral and all of that. So how do we bridge that significant gap very early, understanding that yes, public, um, public health has a, a role to play and a very significant one in that. And, and Ms. L-U-N-D-Y, mm -hmm. I don't want to pronounce it wrong. Landy, I did, <laughs> okay, I did put a comment in the chat with respect to why do we as professional speak breaking silos and we don't act with breaking mm -hmm. silos and that can be a big 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 discussion mm -hmm. thank you very much for, for allowing me the space and where are you from uh, just for the purpose of our audience where are you from i am from trinidad i had a behavior change institute and i i have done a number of workshops Okay. In the, the Caribbean and Trinidad and Tobago. Awesome. You know, when I back down, when I come back down in Trinidad, you know, I, I need to give me some doubles. Some yes. Doubles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And I just want to intervene there. I totally agree with you. We do speak it all the time. Like I was, when I alluded to our MH gap um, solution that was sent down from the World Health Organization. We went full force into MH gap and we were happy to have it because we understood the significance of it. Putting it into our clinics, putting it so that no mental health patient would slip through the cracks. When it came down to the classroom settings where we needed to get our professionals from our outlying clinics to come in and be trained in how to recognize mental health conditions, et cetera. That was a problem. We did, we, there was not, time was not taken to say, we're gonna have to train these people because we've already agreed that this initiative is what we need to help us. But when it came down to the physical releasing of these bodies to get them in, and I understand that there may have been some hiccups along that line with low staff, et cetera, but, more effort had to be done and must be done and must continue to be done to bring it together so that we're not only saying, but we're doing. And I like that. I like that you brought that out. It was there in my mind to bring out, but I forgot to say it, but talk and no action. And we and have to look at happening We have, we have to look at that. Okay. We talk a lot. We talk we because we know we talk a lot. We've heard these things over and over again. But when it comes down to sitting down and saying, okay, let's get let's do it. Let's get it done. There's always some hiccup. But we cannot get it done and we can only resolve to talk because we understand so that we have to keep talking. Right. But when when you have systemic issues, as I would have alluded to in my last training in the Bahamas, mm -hmm. when we have that systemic issue, that political dimension, that governance mm -hmm. dimension, and when you have people own values and systems and beliefs and about corrections, where do we go? Mm -hmm. Where do we go? And um, I am not saying that we are only talking to, to beat up on our own selves, but for us to recognize that in order to break silos, we must have significant energy structures and system investing okay. in this shift so that mm -hmm. it will happen. We, we, we need resources. We need 
we need people, we need machinery, we need mm -hmm. all those things. All those things are silos. Yes. We need yeah. mindset change. Mindset we change. We have mindset that are we could blocking yeah. everything. Yes. Block. Blocking mm -hmm. everything. When we, uh, as I was telling uh, Chris, uh, when we were discussing this, when we believe in, in retributive justice, and not restorative justice, for example, right. we can have all the systems in place. I, as a professional, I would not, I would not do what it is I'm supposed to do for that person who is before me, maybe as a probation officer, maybe as a police officer. If a police officer believe in brutality, as opposed to hope, looking as a young offender example, hope and looking to see, okay, how can I work to bring this person uh, to work together with another institution to bring out the leadership qualities of this individual? Where are we really going? This is a very serious topic. And I hope that this lead institution would have uh, people at every level at this training. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I think we have somebody from the Department of Principal Officer. Okay, go ahead, Frederica Clark King. Good morning. My question is, are there programs that can be um, bring awareness to children, adolescents, young adults, family members that can help them to become aware of and not fair or look down at their any person or family member that may have mental health issues? Well, in Grand Bahama, we don't have any programs as such, but we do have our mental health team, which is a small team in Grand Bahama at this time, that go out to schools that call, we have um, town meetings where we speak with parents and other, um, other persons in the community and we push our education as what is mental health. We go into our um, businesses, we go into um, the schools, we go into the churches and we try to bring across to them what mental health is, what addiction is, these things. But of course, we only get the people that want to come out that may be interested because they have a family member and we know that, but we're not gonna give up on those educational talks. There are, like I said, several um, mental health days that are global that we, work, that we recognize. There's World Mental Health Day, which is October 10th. There is um, Mental Health Week, which is in May. I can't re um, remember the exact dates, but what happens is during those times we do um, we do a large collaboration of um, forums, et cetera, so that we could invite the public. But even then we know that we're lacking. We need more manpower. We don't have a lot, but we try to work with what we have, but we do the best that we can. Um, again, the resources, to get it out there in the way that we want to get it out there is not available. But we, um, we're never gonna stop pushing and we're never going to give up because if we don't advocate for it, who is? Yes, good. Um, we have one more. So just, just, um, just before she, uh, Mr. Clark, um, that is a concern that I have and I'm willing to work with Mr. Clark through yourself or whoever um, to do some sort of initiative where we can find a creative way to bring it across. And I'll speak with Mr. Clark at a later date, but thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Leo at BDOX, you have a question? Um, just a quick question. As correction professional, how do we cope? How do we cope or deal with persons that are mentally challenged when the resources are limited? That's the first question. Um, from a medical um, profession, in terms of the courts, 
if persons have these previous uh, mental challenges, um, I see for some part, uh, for the most part, that persons are sent to the prison um, to spend time, and then when their time is, um, um, is complete, then they would transfer them to SRC. Shouldn't it be the reverse? Just a question. Um, what happens if, if there is a known psychiatric patient that has committed an illness? I mean, that has committed a crime, sorry. <coughs> They're usually um, sent to us, sent to the psychiatric unit, and then um, released back to the Law, back to law enforcement. I don't know what happens after that, but usually the case is they are sick, um, remanded to us first, especially if they're in active psychosis. Maybe Troy could elaborate on the other part. Actually, uh, what Pio is talking about, you have a lot of persons who are sent directly to the prison, mm -hmm. and then they said, okay, then let the doctor get in touch with SRC. Okay. And a lot of times because of the systems and the lack of uh, officers not being in place to help this individual, mm -hmm. that person just languish uh, in the system at BDOCS and, and their, their situation deteriorate. It will. It will. I understand that there is a um, psychiatrist that comes to the prison. Is he, I'm not sure, because I'm in Grand Baham, I'm not sure that he is assigned or he's resident at the prison, prison for persons, or he just comes once a week. One, I'm not sure how that works over there. We, we have one person, we have, a, we have a couple persons that come on Tuesdays. Okay. Yes, on Tuesdays. And they're there to see the entire prison population. Oh, wow, that's impossible. Who, who need to be referred to them, I mean. That's somewhat. But okay, in the meantime, because seeing that it's only um, every Tuesday, right. in the meantime, how do correctional officers cope and how do they deal with persons like that when they are not trained in that to know how to deal with those type persons? Mm -hmm. and, and the key word there is they're not trained because correctional officers are trained their way, okay? They're trained to deal from a correctional officer standpoint. And that is where we need to have mental health professionals come and do training so as to right, come in and do training so as to help you to understand exactly what you're dealing with and the best way to approach. And so definitely that's a dialogue that now needs to happen between Sandalands and the prison so that a program could be put in place where correctional officers will be trained as to how to deal with these persons. So that's something that's lacking, definitely, and we need to get that in place. Yes, thank you.